After five hours, three breaks in court and multiple victim impact statements, the man who killed two people in New Albany has been sentenced to more than 200 years in prison. It's our top story at five. Thanks for joining us. I'm Shay McAllister. And I'm Doug Prophet. Here's the latest on Chirac Douglas, found guilty of the double murder in August. Last year, Douglas shot his wife Brandy and a bystander, Lauren Yell, at a gas station on State Street in New Albany. He then led police on a chase to the Onion Onion a House on Charlestown Road, where he took the owner hostage. Douglas was eventually shot by police and arrested. At today's sentencing, Douglas refused to be sworn in, leading to a delay in court. He then told his defense attorney he wanted whatever sentence the victim's family wanted. His lawyers argued for the minimum sentence, which was still 130 years, but eventually he was given the maximum sentence. That is 240 years in prison. Prosecutor Chris Lane called it a victory for justice. So the message is justice. 240 years was just, and I'm very proud of that. Very proud that that message, as you said, was sent for justice sake because of what happened. And I'm honored to be in this place today to be able to provide that for those families and victims in this community. Sherrock Douglas has another court case coming up for an alleged assault that happened while he was in prison waiting for this trial. A man has died after a fall at the Brown Foreman Distillery on Dixie Highway. First responders say it happened today, just after noon. Investigators tell us it appears that man fell from scaffolding up on the sixth floor of the building. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Brown Foreman says the man was a contractor working at the distillery, and they do extend their deepest condolences to his family. Well, we're following late developing story today about the big strike for the automakers. The United Auto Workers Union could be getting close to a tentative deal with the Ford uh, company, Ford Motor Company. That agreement would be critical to ending the union's six week long strike against the three automakers. As you know, it's also underway here in Louisville. Now, two people with knowledge of the talks told the Associated Press today that the two sides are moving towards a potential deal. Sources say the union has made a counteroffer to Ford that proposes a 25% general wage increase over the life of a four-year contract. It sounds like negotiations on Tuesday extended well into this morning, Wednesday morning. This all comes as Ford is offering unpaid leave to some factory workers still on the job, including at the Louisville assembly plant. Now, then, again, that's the Ford plant down by the airport. We talked with local UAW president Todd Dunn on Monday. They have so many members that, like I said, have come back trying to get ready for the contract as we get closer to it. Their, their manpower is over and above, so they're offering sometimes up to 200 people to go home a day to flip out and go home on their own. And get paid for it? Again, that was from Monday. Again, the strike is still underway outside the Kentucky truck plant in Easter Jefferson County. It's still possible the negotiations could unravel, but if the UAW can reach a tentative deal with Ford, it would be used as a model to seek similar contract settlements with GM and Stellantis. Tonight at 5 o'clock, voting advocates are highlighting the power of black voters as the November election sits just two weeks away. At the top of the ballot, the race for the Kentucky governor. Senior reporter Isaiah Kim Martinez and photojournalist Emma Gefter are talking with groups who say black voices will make a difference on who wins. Organizers for the group Black Voters Matter are emphasizing just how vital the voice of black Kentuckians will be in this election for issues like public safety, the economy, as well as the race for governor. Medium. Simply handing out shirts. There you go, then. And striking up conversations, urging young college students to vote. I feel like as the black community, we don't realize that we're actually bigger than what we think we are. There are the efforts being made before a high stakes election, the governor's seat on the ballot. Do you think that effort will dictate who's in the governor's seat? This year? Absolutely. If we just turn out a few more people, we could literally win an election. The race between incumbent Governor Andy Bashir and challenger Attorney General Daniel Cameron is being watched closely, along with the issues people want solved. We know that we have a poverty issue. We know we have a policing issue. We know that there's people on the ground that want to see change. As history has uh, kind of predicted, the way Kentucky goes in their governor's race, so does the presidential next year. So we know that black voters matter across this state is crucial. Dean Charles Anthony II and other voting rights advocates are on L's campus Wednesday, engaging with some of Louisville's youngest voters. 
making sure they show up to the polls next month. Political parties often really focus on Louisville and Lexington when talking about black voters. They talk about us as pawns to turn out and they don't really try to understand what is important to us. So folks like Celine Mutuye Maria with the Black Leadership Action Coalition of Kentucky have traveled across the state to see what truly matters to black Kentuckians. I understand that there, there's been a lot of economic growth across the state, but is that actually translating into people being able to access these jobs and not face barriers to these jobs? While Mutu Ye Maria says their focus is to get voters to look beyond the top of the ticket, she also acknowledges the governor's race, understandably, is getting the most attention after the protest of 2020. Uh, Daniel Cameron failed to get justice for Breonna Taylor, and that is just one example of the many ways that he does not speak for our community or um, try to work for justice for black communities. In a statement, a spokesperson for the Cameron campaign telling me, quote, Kentuckians know Attorney General Cameron Cameron's obligation is to follow the law no matter what. She goes on to say, quote, people regardless of skin color want their leaders focused. She goes on to say, quote, people regardless of skin color want their leaders focused on growing the economy, improving education and reducing crime, end quote. Isaiah Kim Martinez, WHAS 11 on your side. Well, if you're looking for more information on the governor's race, we have a voter's guide ready on our website right now. You can go check it out at whas11.com. Another really nice fall day across Kentucky, and it started off cloudy, keeping the temperatures really pretty perfect. And then when the sun came out, it uh, got us up into the mid-70s. And I heard earlier, Doug, we hit 80. 80 degrees well, late we'll October. Take, we'll take 80, uh, but we know it's going to change, what, any moment now? Oh, <laughs> we have a big cold snap. In fact, it's going to be the biggest cool down that we've seen this season so far. So typically, our last 80 de degree day is around October 11th, and right now it's today. It's October 25th. So, yeah, we are at 80 degrees. Now just cooled off back to 79, kind of bouncing back and forth out there. Really, the only spot that we are warming to 80 is here right in the immediate metro. You're at 77 in Lebanon. Uh, 77 in Bardstown. Radar is nice and clear. We're seeing plenty of sunshine. In fact, dodging the bulk of the sprinkles that are just off to the north near Indianapolis. So we are seeing those clouds will make a, a return because that stationary front is going to slowly drift our way, bringing us rounds of rain throughout this upcoming weekend. So really starting on Friday, we'll see some morning sprinkles into the afternoon, hopefully going to be clearing out by the time we head towards the evening hours. It's going to be a hit or miss on Saturday with some more scattered showers in that forecast. And then that big bulk of rain is Sunday through Monday where that cold front will finally sweep through, kicking out all of that unsettled weather and bringing us some sunshine. But with that, also some cold temperatures. So looking at your rain chances, Friday scattered morning showers into the evening as well. But Sunday into Monday, that is definitely going to be our biggest rainmaker. Sitting warm in the 70s and 80s, but that cold blast heading our way soon. I'll talk about how cold it's going to get in 10 minutes. All right, Colleen, thank you very much. Now a follow up on the transportation disaster that started at the beginning of the JCPS school year. Superintendent Marty Polio says it could now be two years before parents and students see any improvement. Alexis Jones has more on the continuing issues. They're missing class and returning home late. JCPS busing problems are still impacting students with little relief in sight. For the next two years, we will have an increase in routes. Superintendent Dr. Marty Polio says the jump is due to the district operating under two student assignment plans. Right now, families are able to choose schools close to home or far away. Short term, yes, it is making the situation more difficult. Um, long term, we will see a drop once we minimize and eliminate the old student assignment plan, so to speak, or the one that... Uh, was before our 2021 vote. Polio says the drop will happen after two years. His update came after board member Linda Duncan asked how Western High School's new magnet program will affect transportation. The program will be open to all JCPS students. Dr. Polio says it couldn't make the situation harder, but having more magnet options across the city helps. He adds officials will need to make difficult decisions next year about how and who is transported. However, parent Berkeley Collins says families shouldn't lose out for choosing better performing schools further away from home. Collins suggests sticking to what was done before, splitting up one bus route into two trips. As long as I know my kids can get to school and they can get back home and they can have that education that they need 
and what I want for them. I am fine and they are fine waiting at school for an additional 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half, whatever it is for those ways of buses to come back and get them to take them back home. But JCPS says that would put the district in a worse position. Polio says they're willing to meet parents halfway. As for going backwards, it's not in the district's plans. In Louisville, Alexis Jones, WHAS 11 on your side. Well, JCPS has four options it may consider to improving transportation, including requiring all magnet and traditional students to be dropped off at a central location like a shopping center, or even cutting transportation for any student who attends a magnet or traditional school. Back in Bardstown, controversy continues as the county school district considers a merge of the two high schools. Before last night's special meeting, students, parents and staff lined up in front of the Nelson County Central Office. They were there for a quick meeting called by the Board of Education to vote on the resignation of board member Damon Jackie. Jackie resigned last week after voting against the continued discussion of that high school merger. He told WHAS 11 he chose to resign when he felt other board members were not standing up for the public education system. Whenever I started seeing that there were certain board members that were doing things that make my head kind of scratch and go, I, that doesn't seem right. And then something else happens and then we've got three board members that have apparently refused to listen to the overwhelming majority of the community on this topic of the one high school. Parents say they're sad to see him go, but they understand. As for any more discussion on the merger, it didn't happen last night. The meeting was quick, starting and ending within about five minutes. Well, after more than three weeks, it finally happened. Republicans elected 51-year-old Louisiana State Rep uh, Congressman Mike Johnson as the new Speaker of the House. Johnson's speakership comes after three other nominees failed to secure the votes they needed. Representatives Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, and Tom Emmer all tried and are, did not get the job. Johnson, a constitutional lawyer and staunch Donald Trump ally, has been in Congress since 2017, which will make him the least experienced speaker in 140 years. We know that, uh, that there's a lot going on in our country, domestically and abroad, and we are ready to get to work again to solve those problems. In a letter to colleagues, Johnson outlined his most immediate priorities, which include passing some appropriation bills this week, as well as a short-term funding measure to keep the government open past mid-November. Well, you have a lot to say about this choice as Speaker of the House on the Rant Line. That's coming up at 545, and you can still weigh in about the new speaker. Give the Rant Line a call. The number is 502-582-RANT.